Hello, welcome back, everybody. It's the first session after lunch, so I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, now we have four really wonderful uh, people who are going to share some uh, good insight in the science. So the, fir the first one is going to be uh, Ivan R R Gutman, who is Professor Emeritus from University of Kragujevac. He uh, started like with PhD in chemistry, then he got another one in mathematics. I think we, he was also with Professor Nena Trinajstic. Now he's Professor Emeritus at University of Kragujevac, and we are looking forward uh, to hearing on uh, what is mathematical chemistry. Please. So, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, I'm absolutely sure that you are all eager to learn what is mathematical chemistry. And this is the only reason why you came to my, my short lecture. So thank you very much for coming and for not leaving. Anyway, so this is my name and the place where I am affiliated. And now we start with Newton. You heard about this gentleman. And Newton published a book, also probably you heard about this book, Philosophia Naturalis Principia. This was in 1697. And after publishing this book, people think that the science, which is called mathematical physics, started. So the book, which I mentioned, is the starting point for something which we call today mathematical physics. This was in this year. About 50 years later, motivated by Newton's book, something which we call mathematical chemistry was first mentioned. Uh, this uh, person who wanted to emulate Newton's book so that it will be applicable to chemical problems was a Russian scientist, Mikhail Lomonosov. And Lomonosov simply intended to prepare something which is same or similar to Newton's Principia, but con is concerned with chemistry. Now, the problem was, and he wrote a, a, a paper. We would, today we would say a paper, in that time it was a book. It, and it was in Latin language, and in this book, the title was Elementa Chimie Mathematice. And this is the first time in history that the, the word mathematical chemistry was coined or mentioned. This was in 1741. But it was actually too early, because in that time there was no chemical theory. Uh, the basic laws of chemistry were not known. The concept of molecule was not known, and so on and so on. And so what he did was very little, and actually he formulated a theorem, really a theorem, this, this proofs, which in Latin says verus chemicus debet esse theoreticus and practicus, which means a real chemist must be a theoretician and an experimentalist. But it happens that this is the first theorem of mathematical chemistry. And okay, so we must jump now a little bit because first uh, the laws of chemistry have to be discovered and then we can make some mathematics. And so we will make a jump which is about 200 years. Now, in the time which you can see now on the screen, the quant quantum theory was discovered and formulated and the laws of quantum theory were, f were found. These are the people who participate in this, this, uh, this work. Okay. And then this quantum theory can be applied to, to real chemical problems. And in the period, which again you can see on the screen, uh, the quant quantum theory was applied to molecules. This means it was applied to, to chemical problems. And so this is the beginning of, uh, of, of application of mat mathematics of quantum theory to chemistry. Uh, Paul Dirac was one of the men who did some work in quantum theory, as you may know, and in the year 1929, this is important, Dirac gave the following very important statement. I will read it, also you can read it yourself. The underlying physical laws for mathematical theory, a large part of physics, and of whole of chemistry, is completely known. So the mathematical theory of the whole of chemistry is completely known. This is a statement which is as you will see, I will comment it a little bit. But this is not an end of the statement of Dirac. There is no f f period at the end of this. And the statement goes on. And the difficulty is only that there, is, there are some difficulties. The, the, the laws of, uh, are too complicated to be, to be soluble. 
So there is, there is some difficulty, so it cannot be done immediately. So this was done in, in 1930. He, he, this statement was given in 1929, so we are now more, almost 100 years later. We can say the following. The first part of this statement, that the mathematical theory of whole of chemistry is completely known, is more or less correct. There are some small problems, but we can put it b below the carpet. The other part is that the difficulty is so big that we cannot solve these this mathematical problems is today wrong. Why? Because in the time when Dirac gave this statement, there were no computers. In the meantime, computers appeared, and these so-called equations, much too complicated, are nowadays soluble. Approximately, not exactly, but for applications, especially applications in chemistry, this is enough. So, and this can be computed, solved by computers. In times of Dirac, this was probably a computer. Later, some bigger computers arrived, and today there are some huge computers. And so we can solve the, pro the, the problems by computers today. And this is a so-called computational chemistry, which solves the Schrodinger equations of, in some form. and. Uh, from this, by, by this we can compute practically all interesting, for chemistry, interesting properties of molecules, including geometry, including, including uh, energetics, including uh, uh, electronic properties, including thermodynamic properties, and finally uh, including reactivity. So everything what is interested in chemistry, not exactly, but with sufficient accuracy, we can solve today by using computers. There are uh, routinely available uh, uh, computer packages. And so <coughs> this is a relatively old statement. This statement comes from 1980 or so. And Lico Clementi said the solving, we can calculate everything from chemical point of view. And this, was, this, is, this statement is now almost, almost 50 years old. So that today we can calculate much more than everything. So this could be the end of my lecture. So nowadays the calculations of this kind are done routinely. So you don't need to know the theory. You don't need to know anything. You can calculate it. You just buy the, the package or, or steal the computer package, and then you can make calculations. And this is, I, I would compare this with driving a car. So today you can drive a car. You, have, you don't need to have any idea how this car go, works. And if the car goes wrong, then you, don't, you, are, you are not uh, able to repair the car. You must go to a mechanic. Or you will buy a new one. Or steal one. But, <laughs> okay. But there is still a small problem remains. We must need some problem to remain, because otherwise <laughs> we, would not, we would not have like, anything to do. So this is a small problem. But actually, if you think a little bit, it's not so small. And the problem is the following. Now, we can calculate every property of, of, of any molecule which we, which we need. But we have to decide which, which, which molecule we choose. And as you will see just in a, in a moment, the number of existing molecules, or possible molecules, is enormously large. So let me say a few words about counting chemical compounds. So first, let us see how many chemical compounds we know we have, we have produced. These are the so-called so number of registered chemical compounds. And this, these are the numbers. About 60 million was in 2010. In 2017, it was already 133 million. And today is around 200 million in summer. To, but we, are, we have, I think, today is either the last day of the summer or the first day of autumn. So this number is much bigger than you can see now. And this means the following. Every day, about 15,000. That means every minute, about 10 compounds are produced somewhere in some laboratory. And during my lecture, about 250 more comp co compounds will, will be the, in, in, the, in the realm of, of ex 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 experimentally established chemistry. But so this is awful, really. There are hundreds of millions of compounds. But the number of known chemical compounds is negligibly small compared to the number of possible chemical, com or possible chemical compounds. Let me uh, illustrate this. So we have so-called alkanes. These are the simplest or, or molecules. 
uh, organic molecules, we know about 1,000 such alkanes. And this is the number of possible alkanes. You see, this, these are enormous large numbers. The number of benzenoid hydrocarbons, about, we know about 500. And this is the non uh, the possible number of benzenoid hydrocarbons. But this is still small, what, what we found now. The universe is actually not enough, there is no enough matter in, in the universe to produce all these possible compounds. And there is also no time in the universe. The universe doesn't exist long enough for producing all possible chemical compounds. Let me give you some extreme ex examples. If you have pro proteins, with normal size of 100, 100 amino acids, then this is the number of possible arrangements of amino acids, which is practically infinity. Uh, the eDNA of, of a relatively short DNA chain, one, one million uh, units, has so many, which is, there's, there's no name in, in mathematics for such a big number, so it is simply infinity. <coughs> so, the number of chemical compounds is negligibly small compared to the number of possible chemical compounds, and, which is much worse, this will not be, this cannot be produced any experimentally ever. So there is no, 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 no hope and no chance that we will produce only a very, very minor fraction of, of possible, uh, uh, possible chemical, chemical species. So what then remains? Well, what can I say? I am doing mathematics. <laughs> the only science which can deal with non-existing objects, many, many non-existing objects, is mathematics. There is nothing else. So we must use some kind of mathematics to, to try to treat this, this problem. And so mathematics must be used in chemistry. Uh, okay, so, well, when we use mathematical methods, then we can treat whole classes of compounds, not one compound, but all, all compounds of the one, one type, type, or in the best case, we can treat infinitely many. This only can be done by using mathematics. And so uh, we can treat so many ty types of or so many different molecules, but of course we cannot get exact results. So we will now, this, this treatment by mathematics will help us to somehow reduce the number of molecules which we will then later calculate by uh, standard quantum mechanical methods. And one of these methods, especially I, I do this, say, say this because I am doing this, is to, to model the molecule with a mathematical object, which is called the graph. I will not give, uh, give any definition here. That you can see a molecule, a, a formula, a chemical formula, and a graph, and the analogy is quite obvious. Here is one more example of what is a molecular graph and what is a chemical, chemical formula. And then uh, we associate some numbers to these graphs. This hope that these numbers will give you some very reduced, but some information about the possible chemical properties of these compounds. And for this, we go use something which is called topological index. And here is a formal official definition, what is a topological index. Please read it if you are interested, but I don't expect that you are really interested. And uh, here is a... Uh, Topological indices are sometimes called molecular structure descriptors. And here is a list of the, some of them. There are many more, but there are some. The, the names are not important. The years are interesting. So you see when such indices have been introduced. Some about 50 years ago and some about two years ago. Anyway, here are, th these are relatively simple mathematical expressions. Here you will see some simple expressions you don't need to understand, but everybody will agree that this is very simple compared to a Schrodinger equation. This is connectivity index and this is so-called Sombor index and so on. Now, what, is, what we use, how we use this, we, using such very simple mathematical expressions, without any problem, we can ca calculate these this uh, numbers. Five, five minutes. How many? Five minutes. Five minutes. Yes. Oh, what can I do now? Oh, I am nervous. Who, who, who? Who, who, who? Okay. <laughs> okay. So what can we do with this topological index? We can calculate very easily. And then we can expect that this gives, you, gives us some idea about 
some property which we are interested in. Uh, we are mainly interested in, physic in, in, in pharmacological properties because this you can sell. You can produce some ducks and then you can make money. And here I corrected a number of publications from this year, the very recent publications. Just read the titles. The topological indices are used to, to do something for anti-tuberculosis anti drugs. Then to, topological indices are used for breast cancer drugs, for uh, coronavirus treatment, and so on. Here is one more to coronavirus treatment. So this is what we do with topological indices. And here at the end, uh, sometimes it is successful and sometimes we can make money. So there are some commercial applications and there are patents filled for, for, by, for using topological indices and for certain chemical compounds, which can then later be experimentally produced. And because I still have three minutes, so I, I will maybe sing a song or what else. Okay, I finished my lecture. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for your really interesting question. Well, careful, careful, yes. Uh, we are going to have questions later, uh, but now I would like to invite Professor Laszlo Foro, uh, who comes from beautiful Notre Dame in Indiana. Uh, he is head of the Stavropoulos Center for Complex Quantum Matter. He actually originates from here, nearby. Uh, so he, I think he was, I believe he was born very close to this place. We are now here. And uh, I also know that he likes teaching his students. Okay, his numbers are really impressive. Uh, if I talk about citations and publications, I will not repeat that. But uh, I know he also enjoys teaching both students and the researchers how to solve problems better. And we are going to enjoy his talk. Please. <coughs> Thank you very much for this kind introduction. So uh, the story which I would like to tell you today about how to do scientific research with responsibility it stems from my previous affiliation in Lausanne, where I spent 30 years. And now I am at oh yes. Now I am at the University of Notre Dame in Indiana in the United States, at this beautiful campus, and I continue my research there. So if I want to, to place my topic in a broad context, then it is what are the challenges nowadays, or challenges for us, mainly for physicists or natural scientists. Today we know that the big challenge is uh, information technology and energy. But tomorrow it will be water. Day after tomorrow it will be soil and food. And without uh, time limits, uh, the health and the environment will be a big topic. And of course, uh, we are doing even nowadays, you know, we have colleagues who are doing nowadays these topics, but I think uh, in the future, it will be a dominant activity of ours. So uh, how can uh, study with, with how, we, how can we practice uh, these fields with responsibility? This is, I think, my purpose today. So the context is how, of the study is energy. So I will focus on one subfield and of course, uh, how can we convert uh, solar energy into electricity? We know that we have plenty of energy coming from the sun and we would need only a fraction to convert into electricity. And uh, of course, it is done by, by photovoltaics. We have mainly this uh, 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 silicon uh, solar panels or in Lausanne, where I'm coming from, this is the uh, the um, Dyson Tass solar cells, elaborated by, by Michael Gretzel, who, is, who was a colleague of mine, and uh, it's organic-based uh, solar cells. Deficiency is somewhat low, but uh, uh, what is, I think, in the community that these solar cells are expensive, they need complex technology, energy efficiency should be improved, and the benefit is only uh, long-term. And we would need uh, new, more efficient, and cheaper materials. And the, in this chart for efficiency, the function of year, you see several uh, generations of solar cells. And the improve of efficiency during the years is coming from improving the materials. So material science is very important. Material science of chemistry is very important in this uh, improvement. And what is lately the star is this 
these perovskites uh, just I highlight the progress in efficiency in the last 10 years and this is full grant you know so uh, and the material which uh, uh, is the source of this improvement is this perovskite it's called methyl ammonium lead iodide you know. and the whole story of this family starts in 1976 by Dieter Weber who was a professor of chemistry in Stuttgart and he has invented these cluster materials you, so you can see the the building unit lead iodide uh, cluster and from this unit one can make uh, zero dimensional two dimensional uh, three dimensional materials and they are semiconductors so if one shine lights one creates electronic holes and one can evacuate these electronic holes uh, to get uh, eventual electricity but those days it wasn't a goal it was just for opto electricians you know to study these particles which are formed by electron hole interactions called excitons but the interest uh, decayed very rapidly and until i would say 2012 i mean they came back to uh, the into the scientific interest and this coming from a publication from the oxford group henry snade who is the leader of the group and he published a paper in science showing that actually this material has a very nice absorption of light in the red so if you say this is a the wavelength red light comes here and it absorbs uh, uh, above the red and this is the cross section of the solar cell so there is uh, the electrodes there is some whole electron transporting layers and the perovskite and you see that this is not a very not very appealing material so it looks like scrambled eggs you know or or, or uh, i don't know some some uh, low quality material low technical ma materials but nevertheless if one uh, shine lights put electrodes the efficiency nowadays though it's only 12 percent nowadays it's 25 percent imagine this is the efficiency of the best silicon single crystals so it's really amazing yeah. and it was not uh, uh, surprising that actually uh, people were well the problem is that they've led uh, inside and people would think also re replacing lead with tin uh, because lead is known that it's not very good for health but nevertheless uh, nobody uh, care did care for the lead because of this high efficiency and actually uh, there there are already plants producing the solar cells and the, the also the the strategies to to make kilometer squares of this this uh, this photovoltaic solar cells and you know knowing that it's lead i think it's not wise so I, th I would say it's even irresponsible before we know what are the health hazards you know related to the, and here i call the, the responsibility of us researchers so uh, what is the problem that if we have a solar cell and they fail from break and the water the, the rain washes out the lead into the soil and the soil is contaminated and by the food chain it gets to our body and uh, this is uh, not good so we have to know uh, what are the health hazards related due to lex exposure and unfortunately even nowadays you know there are not too many studies on the lead toxicity related to these structures so one of i think the uh, without being too proud one of the most important is coming from my lab and the idea was that actually that we have to know what are health hazards and i hired a biologist a post a doctoral student in biology is important you know and of course it cannot be done just by a physicist and here comes the interdisciplinary disability which was evoked yesterday many times and this is i think not just just uh, just words it is really important strategy should be uh, should be adapted by us and you can see that well, we have to make the materials we have to know to characterize and this is uh, a task of a chemist or material scientist or physicist uh, we have to expose you know cells to do in vitro studies uh, and this is also a task of a physicist and a chemist why chemists because we have to know how to disperse these materials how to to meet these materials the cells you know and in vitro study is not sufficient we have to also do in vivo studies you know and this is what also we, 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 we did with with drosophilia with, with c elegans with these uh, small model elements 
and then we have to take the, make the conclusions. So this is what we've done. I don't want to go to all this, but uh, we have to characterize the materials. So this is, you can see uh, a set where, uh, uh, of materials produced uh, uh, different. This is just compare the, the, the size of the amount of this material, what we have to, to dissolve, dissolve in water. We have to know how this will water. How does it dissolve? in physiological uh, environment, so in, in, the, in the, the body. So this is also a, a task which we do have to do. Uh, we know what are the, the exposures of our body. So we can, by inhalation, by ingestion, and also by skin. Of course, the most severe is uh, why, by inhalation. Uh, we have to study uh, new, uh, uh, neuroblastoma, so neurons, and also skin cells, epithelial cells. So these are the pulmonary cells, these are the, the codes of the cells, tender cell lines, what we studied. And of course, we have to do a study in the function of concentration, and not only the lead version, but we also studied the thin version, which was evoked to be uh, less dangerous, you know. So this is uh, what we, we uh, adapted, and uh, we did many, many studies. So effect on the gene expression, on the life cycle, this and that, just to illustrate uh, uh, for neuroblastoma and the uh, skin cells, uh, non-exposed, and then uh, uh, exposure to 100 uh, uh, milligram or microgram per milliliter during five days. And you can see that uh, in five days, uh, increasing the dose, the number of, of cells is decreasing. You know, cells they don't reproduce; they die. And even the skin cells, you know, they become oops. Uh, strange so we create giant cells you know somehow the physiology of the cell changes so they are not good also we went after to study uh, on the small uh, animals the foyer which is very nice because it's close to the human genome uh, so just to illustrate what happens these are two types you know the wild type and there is a red eye uh, type of the foyer we studied both, and you can see uh, the non-exposed with 100 micrograms per meter lead thin, and for the two white types, put in the food, and you can see what is the effect. Devastating, you know. Non-exposed, they they divide normally, and exposed, uh, they die. You know. So these are not good. Okay, fine. Uh, can we prevent uh, uh, leaching out of lead? Can we somehow bind these materials? And uh, of course, this is a task of a chemist, you know. And we learned, actually we learned by doing the toxic studies that uh, the physiological liquid, where there are phosphates, they can bind the lead. And uh, so this is the study, x-rays, you know, the, we studied the x-rays, the normal material, this is a structure, the refinement, this is the phosphate refinement, and then when they react, you know. And the bottom line is that, that actually, uh, these are very good materials, the, the phosphates. Uh, I will play once again uh, this uh, video. So uh, this is the, in presence of phosphates, in no phosphate. And when uh, water goes through, the phosphate block immediately the lead. They don't leach out, why? Uh, there is no uh, phosphate, they leach out, you know. So this is a very good proof that actually it's very efficient. And this is just showing on one device, you know, how efficient it is. So it still works with, with the phosphate inside because it's a large gap semiconductor, light goes through, it doesn't block, doesn't absorb. So the perovskite uh, does its work. Okay, so we know uh, uh, what are the health hazards. Uh, we know how to prevent it. Are there applications beyond photovoltaics where these materials are profitable for us? And uh, of course there are, but first, you know, the strategy of, or the philosophy of my lab is that uh, the alpha of all research in physics, at least quantum physics, is materials. That's why, you know, in my lab, at a given time, I have four postdocs in chemistry, although my lab is lab of physicists, you know, because it's evident that we have to be able to make materials, you know, we have to uh, work with professionals. And just to show, this is a thin crystal growth of this 
this, uh, uh, the lead version, the iodine version of the perovskite, uh, we can make wires of this. And this is uh, fantastic or, or even surprising because perovskite are cubic materials. And it means that, that we can grow these wires that there's a preferential direction, you know, so we can have a preferential direction to go these wires. And look at this. Uh, no. it's Puss. And this is a real time recording in the lab. Je peux faire la compétition qui va être celle-là, mais elle est très époustouzante. Et au début, ils sont rouges à travers. Et je dois vous dire qu'il n'y a pas de meilleure expérience pour un étudiant pour motiver les étudiants. En fait, les étudiants ont perdu le dernier métro cette nuit parce qu'il était tellement amusé how nature uh, acted in front of his eyes. Uh, so this was one, but also we can make even nanowires of this, which is fantastic. So, so we control the synthesis of these materials at, at many landscapes, I would say. You know? And of course, so one thing what we, okay, also engineering. So it's not only physics, chemistry, but also engineering is, is, is important. So with the uh, EBM lithography, we made a, a large array of these wires, you know, in the nanochannels. So, uh, carved with even lithography, and I just give you the end result. Okay, so the students they like, you know, the performance, of course, you know. Uh, so you see how these nanowires, you know, are growing from upside down in these mic nanochannels. You know, it's like the curtain falls. Uh, during the performance, but it's not the end of the person, it's the beginning. So we can make wafer size arrays of these highways of these beautiful nanowires for optoelectronics for many applications. They are perfect structures. Uh, good. And uh, this is one example what are they good for? They're good for making uh, photo detectors. Here you see, okay, here you see, uh, oops. Let me come back. Here you see a photo detector. It's a platinum electrodes, and below is graphene. Why is graphene? Because graphene, you know, it's a new material. It's called quantum material, whatever it means. It's a new material which can amplify the signal. So amplify the effect of photoelectrons because with, with light, we induce electrons, and the electrons actually are detectors of the light intensity. Imagine, so how many, how many electrons we create? Uh, for a given input of watts of light, this is the efficiency, or called responsibility, of the of the photo detector. And just I bring your attention to this number: responsibility is six times ten to the six ampere per watt. So for how many watts input of light energy, how many amperes of electricity we get? And this number is enormous. In the usual photo detectors, what we use in the lab, what Zora is using or, or, or I, it's 0.6 ampere per watt. It's a based on silicon. This is six million, uh, six million times higher. It means that one single photon could be detected with such a photo detector. It's really, it's, it's amazing. Now, can we use for something else? Of course we can for X-rays. Once again, if we create these photo electrons very efficiently, we can use it for image formation, for x-rays. And you know, one problem with x-rays is that they are harmful, you know. You don't want to be exposed many times to x-ray machines because they ionize radiations, they are good for, for health. If you can reduce the quantity of x-rays for having the same image quality, that's beneficial. And of course, for this, we made it. We use a different technique, so it's called uh, aerosol jet printing is not new, but we were the first to apply for this material. So with this machine, we can focus the material uh, coming out from the nozzle of this, this machine and deposit where we want. And look at this, these structures. Once again, you see unique structure of the material. Look at, for example, these pillars. So we make high structures uh, of this material deposit without spreading all over the place. So. Uh, then here is the unit for our X-ray detector. 
once again, we use graphene to amplify the, the signal. We have the pillar of this uh, telescope and the gold electrodes. In the real images, this like, and this is the curve as a fun the intensity as a function of the, the accelerating voltage. And these numbers tell you nothing, but if you I just say that it's 10,000 times more sensitive than a standard X-ray device, then you realize that it's something new. You know. It's something really impo important. And this is the, the element of X-ray machine, time-wise, two minutes, okay? So detection of gamma rays. Uh, we heard uh, this morning, uh, Dr. Bugai, that irradiation is important. You know, it's important in to detecting, to know how much irradiation are we exposed in different environments, and it's also important for, for, uh, uh, for therapy. And gamma rays you know, are very energetic and could be very harmful. So we have to know in the environment where we are exposed to gamma rays or gamma rays are created, how much are there. And we can use this material again, not the iodine version, but the bromide version, but this is a detail. And here you see the, the setup, what we have simple setup. This is a crystal with electrodes and shows that we are very sensitive. When the material is exposed to irradiation, then current is created, and with the current, we can calibrate the dose, how much we have. You have to know that gamma rays are very energetic. Mega electron volt can uh, attain. So in order to, in order to, uh, to let the gamma rays to interact with the materials, we have to also have big crystals, not only small ones, because they have to interact before they leave the crystal. So uh, what we did, actually we studied this as a function of size. This is a photocurrent as a volume. And maybe this number doesn't tell you much, uh, 1,000 uh, cubic centimeter. But in the image, if I show the image, then you see. This is the crystal. you know, And what you see is unique. It's not in the. Uh, 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 Guinness Book of Vertical because we didn't submit, you know, but otherwise it should be there because this is 3.8 kilogram crystal. So it's like a newborn baby. And this is really, really fantastic. What my chemists, you know, they don't calculate, they just do it and, and, and uh, they made it. So this is really uh, the, well, of course, neutron detection, just to flash you that these materials are also good for neutrons. Neutrons, they don't create themselves electrons, photoelectrons, but they, we can use a transformer, uh, a transducer, and this could be gadolinium. Basically, gadolinium is absor absorbs neutrons, and after that, being excited, they create electrons or gamma rays, and these gamma rays create electrons. And this is one of our detectors. Uh, yes, yes, I'm, I'm finishing. This is uh, all in one. So, because the quality or the characters of this crystal, that they engulf everything. It can engulf uh, a fly, it can engulf uh, the dinosaurs, it can uh, engulf a uh, gadolinium, and we have the transducer within the crystal. Good. Of course, and when you publish, you know, there is a lot of you know, social media, whatever, and students, they like it, and whatever. But uh, let me just flash my collaborators and the great acknowledgement for my wonderful team, and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for a very beautiful and very enjoy enjoyable speech. Uh, it was really wonderful. And now I believe we continue with the next superstar who has joined us uh, via Zoom today. So we just have superstars today. <laughs> we are really lucky. So Yuri Gogozzi is uh, our next speaker. Uh, he's distinguished uh, university professor at Drexel University College of Engineering in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He is working in different nanostructures. Uh, he is famous, like for, this, uh, for uh, supercapacitors, uh, for hydrothermal synthesis, for desalination, uh, and um, his numbers are really impressive. I won't read them uh, either. But he, uh, but I, we are really very very lucky. So uh, I will uh, I will give the signal like five minutes before the end. And now we are looking forward to your contribution. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for this kind of introduction. Can you see my slides correctly now? Okay. Yes. yes, I think so. I can see them on screen. 
Well, again, um, I apologize for not being uh, able to uh, present in person, but I'm delighted to speak at this conference. And actually, uh, two previous, previous talks uh, provided an excellent, excellent introduction to uh, my presentation here, because I'm going to talk about uh, design of material, really, which is to a large extent uh, mathematics needed to predict so many new materials and analyze them. And also, a uh, brilliant last of four uh, gave an excellent uh, explanation to material science and role of materials in the world. I am going to talk today about the family of materials that we discovered about a decade ago, which we called Maxine's two-dimensional carbides and nitrides. Those are the structures you see on these slides. They come in a variety of colors, sizes, properties, really open a new page in materials research. And again, after Lasso's talk, I don't need to really uh, explain the role of materials in progress of humanity. Uh, materials truly define each era of uh, uh, humankind uh, development here. And, of course, they are also absolutely critical in solving problems that our society faces, including energy, water, food, environmental, treating disease here. It's impossible without materials. Better materials give us better generation, harvesting, storage, energy, and in my vision, future technologies will also become distributed materials. Well, we need not that much these huge crystals that Laszlo showed at the end of his uh, talk, even they may be capturing imagination, but more tiny crystals that he showed growing in uh, nanofluidic channels here. So we really need nanomaterials, which enable flexible, variable technologies which consume less energy when used and truly may play a revolutionary role in technology development. And especially my group works a lot on materials for energy. And again, the previous talk provided you uh, with an excellent introduction to the subject here, uh, because we need better materials to achieve uh, photo or electrochemical synthesis, basically get uh, artificial photosynthesis to the level nature does, but much faster and much better. We need to produce electrical energy, and you just have heard about uh, solar energy, but we also need to store it. The same is true for hydrogen production, which is the next alternative fluid and capture of carbon dioxide. It's all done materials. In my group particular, we largely focus on energy storage, and this is a review article we published with a couple of colleagues from Europe and the United States uh, in science in 2019, explaining why nanomaterials particularly will play a key role in future energy storage technologies. And truly, the nano revolution started long ago with the discovery of fullerene and understanding of beautiful chemistry, atomistic design at the nanoscale, followed by carbon nanotubes and, of course, graphene, which is one of the most widely discussed materials. Uh, Andrei Gaim, of course, got Nobel Prize uh, for this discovery here. But what is important, while probably majority of people, even non-scientists, are aware of graphene, Few people appreciate how many two-dimensional materials are available to us today. Really, we are moving towards a paradigm change from single wonder material, uh, whether it was obsidian uh, for uh, um, people in uh, Central and South America centuries ago, or silicon, which, which made our devices possible, or graphene, everyone is talking about today. To the, the era where we can design materials and devices by piling up, combining two-dimensional, but eventually also zero-dimensional 
uh, one-dimensional materials into new hybrid materials and build an entire devices of molecular building blocks here. So really, we are, in my opinion, standing uh, as the doorsteps of a new area of materials research. Material science, as we know it nowadays, was actually created just about 56 years ago, progressing from metallurgical mining engineering from polymers here, where ceramics, metals, polymers were combined into a field of material science. It's like material society was created 50 years ago. And while this materials will be important, the future lays with artificial design materials that can give us properties which we don't have in current materials. We can design materials using the same uh, mathematical chemistry uh, that you have heard about earlier in this session to fit to the need of future technologies. And we actually have a potential to do it. We need multifunctional, programmable, assembled materials, devices that can be directly assembled from nanoscale building blocks without multi-billion dollar foundries needed today to make electronics here. And of course, this all needs to be guided by simulation, machine learning, artificial intelligence. We cannot deal with this millions of compounds and even the two-dimensional materials world. A uh, couple of hundreds of 2D materials have already been reported alone. So really the future of material science, in my opinion, evolves into sustainable chemical synthesis, programmable energy efficient assembly of nanomaterials, which will be guided by again computer uh, design here. This is where we are trying to move the world. And uh, we in our group contribute uh, as much as we can to this goal, particularly about GKD goal. We discovered at Drexel University with my colleague, Professor Michel Barzoma, our student, Michael Nagib, an entirely new family of dimensional materials, which we called Maxines, which we use for a variety of applications nowadays, from energy harvesting and storage to water purification, desalination, medicine, and others. Let me very briefly explain what these materials are. These materials are built of transition metals, these blue atoms in the periodic table. You can see atoms in blue here. They are bonded by carbon and nitrogen. So we call them carbides and nitrides. There are also carbon nitrides. And read tomorrow as uh, issue of Nature Nano, we announce another subfamily of maxine, oxycarbide maxine. Uh, the paper will be published uh, uh, tomorrow. But they also have surfaces terminated by oxygen, OH, chalcogens, halogens, at least 10 different terminations. If you do the math, taking into account the two, three, four, or five layer of transition metal, which we call M element, X stands actually for carbon and nitrogen. This is where name maxine come from. T stands for termination. There are at least about 1,000 simple composition possible. If you take into account solid solution, we can mix and match different elements in M sublattice metal or X sublattice. We have virtually infinite number of 2D structures, building blocks for future technologies. But moreover, we can actually intercalate them. And all these elements in blue have been demonstrated as intercalants. Plus, of course, this is not the limit. Uh, we can also intercalate molecules, ions. Uh, also, they come from max phases using this element in A I'm not going to talk about today. So basically, we can design with the entire periodic table of elements. However, as we talk about sustainability today, what is also important, we need to consider elements that are abundant and available to us here. In particular, what is important, titanium, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine on the surface. Those are exactly the elements which build a large variety of maxines, majority of the most studied carbides, nitrides, carbon nitride maxines. 
And of course, all the surface terminations are also very abundant elements, hydrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, sulfur, and so on here. So again, something we need to take into account. We have materials made of abundant elements. Moreover, as I already mentioned at the beginning, we have a variety. We really design atomistically precise materials with different number of atomic layers. We can make atomic sandwiches where one transition metal, for example, chromium or moly is on the surface. Another element, for example, titanium is in the middle. Or Maxine's ordered in plane when the alternating atomic columns probably easier to see in a 2D projection with alternating elements. And if you remove one, you get rows of vacancies, die vacancies on the surface. And of course, I mentioned, we can mix and match, make solid solution. If we take four or five transition metals, we can make high entropy, multi-elemental maxine. So sky is the limit. And they actually are not only most diverse, but they provide extreme mechanical properties and metallic conductivity, greatly complementing um, chalcogenides, oxides, other, semiconducting and dielectric materials. Recall that graphene praise for its conductivity is a zero band gap semiconductors. Many maxines are true metals with a high density of state at the Fermi level, high concentration of carriers. Moreover, unlike many exotic materials, they can be made in large quantities. You can see one of my postdocs, John Jung, holding one kilogram of maxine made in our laboratory using reactors uh, designed by MRC Ukraine uh, for us. So, scalable synthesis is possible. So we have a variety of materials. We can produce them at scale, even in the lake. And moreover, since they have this oxygen OH typically termination on the surface, they have high negative charge on the surface. So what does it mean practically? They can dissolve, disperse, be dispersed in water without uh, any surfactant binders without any additional toxic chemical that need to burn after that here. So we stack with ceramic powder, we etch it make maxine, sorry I don't have to time to talk about details how we do it, and we end up with this colloidal solution. And we can make it thin or thick depending on what we want to do, whether we want to make ink for inkjet printing for example with this viscosity, or we can make liquid crystalline solution to draw fibers out of it. Or, for example, Dr. Blade, thick film on the surface. We can basically prepare any kind of dispersion. And we have control materials rheology. We can basically manufacture it by any known technique, 2D printing, 3D printing, uh, screen printing, uh, spray coating, spin coating, doctor blading, pretty much you name it here, interfacial assembly. What it means that we can have a huge number of materials manufactured from abandoned precursors, processable in large quantities even at the lab, and process it from pure water, no binder, no surfactant. But all this only important if these materials bring properties other materials don't have. And they do. They are the most conductive, truly metallic two-dimensional materials, about an order of magnitude more conducting than, say, reducing graphene oxide, typical uh, type of graphene uh, used uh, in manufacturing composites, films, and so on. They also have very high breakdown current, two orders of magnitude higher than copper. So you can lodge a high current through even large single flake, single monolayer, nanometer, thin flake of maxine. They have plasmonic colors, very efficient light to heat conversion, can be used from uh, cancer treatment by photothermal therapy to water desalination using sunlight here. And moreover, extremely strong. They are strongest of all solution processes to the materials. That's why we can make single layer flakes. You can see this optical micrograph up to 20, 40 microns in size. You cannot do this with oxide to dioxide. You cannot do it with the chalcogenides here. Five but minutes, five minutes. Thanks, I will try to finish. It will be brief. Really, 
in the big world, beside material scientists like uh, Laszlo, myself, no one really needs materials. People need useful devices, products, applications. So materials we create are building blocks for future technologies. And what is important, since we can make them in larger quantities, I showed to you, we can make them with extreme properties. For example, we can make freestanding one micron film, and you cannot do it with metal. You cannot make easily process metal foil to the thickness here, like aluminum. And they have the same strength as aluminum foil high conductivity. With larger quantities, we can use them for environmental application, not only for small electronic or sensors here. And naturally, they already are being explored in solar energy application, particularly electron hole transport layers in solar cells. They can harvest ultrasonic electrokinetic energy, salinity gradient harvesting, piezoelectric, triboelectric, thermoelectric, uh, humidity, and so on. So there are many ways they can be used in energy harvesting. We showed that by incorporating single platinum atoms in defects, vacancies on the surface of maxines, we can achieve the same performance and conventional platinum and carbon catalyst used for hydrogen evolution reaction, for hydrogen production, but with at least an order of magnitude smaller use of noble metal, platinum. We widely use maxine, research maxines for energy storage. Why? Everyone is interested in high rate, high power storage. What is needed for this? What does it mean actually charging a battery quickly? It simply means running a high current through a battery. You know what happens when you have poorly conducting material and you run a high current, joule heating. That's why batteries catch fire sometimes. If we have highly conducting materials with electronic conductivity, unlike current battery materials, but ability of redox reaction storage, transition metal, moly, titanium, niobium, vanadium, the same as using lithium ion batteries, plus ionic transport and no solid state diffusion to dematerials all surface, we may finally have really high rate, high power storage devices. The use in medicine biomedical application increases very quickly. I already mentioned photothermal therapy, but also theranostics. You can absorb drugs between layers of maxines, antibacterial properties, epidermal electronics, implantable and uh, epidermal electrodes, variety of applications. Research started just a couple of years ago, but you see how quickly it's picking up. This number actually comes from summer, like a first half a year uh, of uh, 2022 here. So basically to summarize what I said to you today and finish on time here. Material scientists keep discovering new materials, increasing a number of building blocks for future materials devices for future technologies. Just like uh, the first presentation of Professor Gutman was talking about huge number of chemicals, you can look at this 2D materials as a huge extended molecules, or you can look at them as materials and building blocks, because sometimes we use mono layers of those materials as a film, for example, or particles, say for photothermal therapy, or we can build entire devices. Hussam al-Sharif from KAUST already talks about development of new field, which he called maxitronics, because there are so many applications of maxine in electronic, optoelectronic communication, antennas, electromagnetic shielding, functional textiles, and so on here. I briefly mentioned a few biomedical applications. In fact, there are many, including DNA sequences, sequencing, including uh, bactericidal uh, films and so on here. Sensing, uh, optoelectronics, a part of it here, again, explained by plasma resonances of maxines in UV visible infrared range. But maxine interacts strongly with electromagnetic wave across the entire range from UV 
to radio waves. That's why they can be used in antennas and shielding. Environmental application. I truly didn't have time to talk about it today, but consider uh, what you probably know about use of graphene oxide for water purification, desalination. We have two-dimensional materials with polar surfaces that can selectively absorb or reject ions another range of application. And of course, what I mentioned, all kind of batteries, energy storage devices, plus energy harvesting. So again, new materials open new horizon. We need to remember about making them in a sustainable way from abundant element. Smaller materials can actually potentially decrease the total use of materials, elements we take from the earth because we'll have less waste coming from machining, even like a silicon machine. And this is my very last slide. Um, development of this enormous family of materials would be an impossible task for any team. My team is large. It includes researchers from at least a dozen of different countries. We work with people from at least 20 different countries collaborate, including Ukraine, where I originally come from, Holland, France, England, Germany, many um, European countries, China, Korea, Japan, Australia, pretty much around the world. Just like a ref composition of my team reflects, we have scientists coming from Africa, we can scientists coming from Ukraine, Russia, Moldova here. And finally, uh, really, uh, this conference uh, happens in a very difficult uh, time geopolitically because probably one of the largest threats uh, to sustainable world and development comes from totalitarian regimes uh, uh, like uh, Putin's regime. So also uh, appeal to all of you to provide support to Ukrainian scientists and to peace in the world, then we will be able to build a sustainable future for the world. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, many thanks for your beautiful talk. It was like a glimpse into our future where all these materials will come in our daily devices, improve the quality of our lives and health. So we can look forward to the following years and decades. We'll take questions after the next talk. The last talk is going to be given by Carlo Rizzuta. Uh, he's a professor of physics of matter and he's presently chair of the General Assembly of the Central European Research Infrastructure Consortium in Trieste. And before he was at Synchrotron Trieste, he's also affiliated uh, at the University of Genoa. He was teaching all over the world, like in Lausanne, Mag McGill, Imperial College, Santiago de Chile, Zagreb. So please, Professor De Tutor, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, I will not speak about science, or uh, maybe I will speak about a different type of science which uh, can be very useful for the sustainability of basic science and the research in general. And this is, uh, let's call it uh, policy science uh, in some way. Uh, one point, uh, one problem that was raised this morning uh, uh, by somebody is that uh, to be able to speak with uh, the political level, uh, you don't have a strong enough voice. Uh, now, this uh, can be uh, approached in two ways. Either you raise the voice, but if you try to have the population behind you, uh, well, good luck. Uh, there is another way, which is uh, the uh, amplification by phase-locked uh, uh, amplifiers. Uh, let's see whether I can explain how you can have uh, phase-locked amplifiers in policy. Now, uh, I will speak about the multidisciplinary and multiprobe research in material sciences, but how to build these uh, through uh, uh, inst institutions. Uh, the specific example is Serik Eric, but there is, uh, this is following a general approach that we have succeeded in starting in Europe. And uh, let's see whether I am able to link these different things together. Let me start with material science. Uh, modern science based uh, technological process, but progress, but also basic research 
in material science uh, requires a development of knowledge. Uh, this uh, depends very strongly on the availability of different analytical and uh, synthesis techniques uh, by using, uh, I am more a physicist than a chemist, but by using probes, uh, non-destructive probes possibly, like photons, which are very used, neutrons are a bit less used, electrons are very used, nuclear spins, NMR, atoms, ions, and so forth. And uh, unrestricted access to a wide range of techniques uh, is a strategic need. I mean, Europe uh, has been in a very good position because as many of these probes, because as many countries that have been buying these probes, but there are limits. Because this requires uh, strong investments in large medium equipment, and even large countries and institutions cannot invest enough to acquire all the needed uh, equipment and probes. Not only materials, by the way, but also in other fields. If you take environment or medicine, you see the same problem. So the uh, European countries have agreed to follow a joint uh, strategy through a European forum, ESPRI, in which uh, both scientists and ministries are represented. And this is one first trick of the solution. You have to bring in government people in uh, dealing with science. The ERIC approach in material science Almost every country has some cutting-edge equipment, but uh, limited coverage, and uh, very often there are very good equipment which are not used, or are very little used. They are hidden in a university institute, are the property of somebody, and access is not easy. If this equipment is made available, for example, uh, at all the whole European level, or better, global level, the, uh, uh, and integrated in a quality-based approach by, for example, accepting peer review selected proposals, then you can uh, realize a wider access, better used, uh, while improving the cost-benefit ratio of the investments. So you are uh, attracting good users to good instruments. And uh, uh, the development of an integrated European research area allows the support, upgrade, and opening of the facilities of different countries. But this is not yet enough, because uh, again, if you're a material scientist, you have to apply for access to different techniques, and over and over, and then you wait for months, and this is very long. So the ERIC, uh, in, in the case of CERIC, Allows, allows to integrate the resources in one institution. And therefore, and not only allows to integrate, but all, allows also some uh, uh, financial and fiscal instruments that you would not have if you are sitting in a university. So this is implemented in the material science base ERIC and by other ERICs in several other fields like life and medicine environmental, social, and human science, uh, and energy. What is an ERIC? What is this instrument, uh, policy instrument? It is uh, the so-called European Research Infrastructure Consortium. This is an international entity, which is not set up by going to each government and asking, please, can we set up an international intergovernmental facility? but is based on the European law and is a spin-off of the European law. You know, there are, there is a, uh, this uh, idea came by uh, setting up in Trieste the ICGAB, the International uh, uh, Center for Genetics and Biotechnology, as a spin-off from uh, the United Nations. We did set up a small thing from the United Nations, then it became independent. So this is a, a, a like cells that divide. So the uh, European law allows uh, regulations which are implemented by the European Commission and uh, these uh, ERICs are set up by request by three countries of which only one needs to be a European country. So they can be participated also by uh, uh, all the third countries and the international organizations. 
The members of the ERIC are the countries. So they sit in the governance of the ERIC. So you have a direct link with the government. And the councils are composed by government representatives and science representatives. So they sit side, side by side, direct link. The ERICs have some of the benefits of international organizations, tax exemption. If you save 20% on, on procurement is a good thing. Simpler procurement rules, if you avoid European procurement rules, is much simpler. This is good. And, uh, uh, and some other advantages, not all, but some. Now there are 24 ERICs in all science fields within 10 years, so it has been easy to set them up they really started. Most of them are distributed. So instead of having a large facility in one of the countries with all the other countries contributing for environment, for material science, for medicine, is much better that each country opens its own facility in a unique environment. So at this point, you have facilities in every country which are open to every country. Uh, and this is uh, uh, the trick uh, that is introduced in uh, the ERICs. In uh, CERIC ERIC, which was one of the earliest ones, uh, uh, and this has been set up also to test how it was working, has been set up in less than one year, or in about one year, is a, a research infrastructure which has eight countries as members in Central European uh, Europe, in Central Europe. Each member hosts a national partner facility, which was already existing, with top quality research and techniques with different probes. Scientific quality is ensured by international peer review for users and by international advice on instruments and research. And this drives the government's investments, because when you go to the government and you say, hey, we have an international advisory committee that is asking to invest more in your facility, you don't have to bring out anything. Invest at home, then the governments listen, and they, uh, then they are also ready to invest more. The scope of CERIC is uh, to get, provide integrated competitive access to both research infrastructures and now also to data, because actually this is the next uh, growing part of the joint uh, access and is uh, uh, to support excellent science in the fields of materials and biomaterials, analysis and synthesis, and nanotechnology, of course, support knowledge production and transfer, stimulate and support the international training and mobility, and speed up what was the main purpose in the beginning, the east-west alignment within the European research area, because everything seemed to be happening in the west. Services. Uh, we offer one single open access, allowing to combine in any possible way the existing techniques plus techniques of other institutions that are outside uh, of ERIC, for example, lasers in Greece, just to give an example. The peer review evaluation guarantees competitive free access. If you are accepted, you go in for free and you are paid the travel, actually, so you are supported for travel. The only thing that you have to do is to publish. You don't keep it for yourself. And uh, uh, this service is also open to commercial users, but in this case, they have to pay. So actually, one thing that we have been able to do is uh, to open a number of facilities that did not have uh, commercial access to commercial access, because once you are visible, at international level does not mean that you are sitting in Hungary or in Zagreb uh, to get an industry from Germany, for example. At this point, you are visible and you are attractive. So in, since the foundation of uh, Seric Eric, we had uh, the proposals that have arrived uh, are, are more than 1,500 from 54 countries. The countries, you can look at the countries. Italy is uh, very large because it's large the uh, number of users uh, compared to other countries. Of course, Germany is not as large, but it's not hosting any facility. So it's coming from abroad, from our point of view. 
Uh, there are uh, others, uh, and you have the rest of the list over there, and we cover practically all the continents and most uh, countries that are doing any uh, uh, reasonable research. Commercial access, we collaborate with industry in the name of the partners, so we help the partners to have industrial access, and uh, we uh, 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 help them to have joint research and development uh, activities, access to instrumentation, contract research, joint application for projects, training, and the market plots for innovation, which uh, and then support if they happen to spin off and start up. Now, which are the partner facilities? Very quickly, Austria is uh, scattering equipment in Graz, but they have been uh, building a uh, beamline in Trieste, so this is also included. Czech Republic, the same story, surface analysis at Charles University, but also beamline in Trieste. This was uh, giving why uh, this came out easily, because there was a past. Croatia has the ion beams in Rudir Boskvich. Hungary has a very good neutron scattering uh, center. Italy has the photon beam lines, Romania has uh, 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 electron microscopy and EPR, Poland has a photon beam lines and cryo EM, which is now going very strong in biology, Slovenia is an MR, uh, and including solid state MR, an MR. One of the, the members is Serbia. At the moment, uh, Serbia does not have uh, an operating facility and uh, uh, which uh, we are now asking to the government to subsidize and fund uh, and come forward to make a proposal which will be selected then evaluated by our international committee. This is another trick that you have to do because otherwise governments can come with non-excellent uh, non, non facilities. So you have to have a filter. When you deal with governments, pay attention always scientific filter. Promotional access, we are going and looking for users, helping users to become users. This is a bottleneck that typically you have in these facilities, and then we uh, give them technical support for uh, uh, the operation. So I finished with the slides, but you will ask me what is uh, the trick, the instrumental trick to uh, be heard by the governments. Okay, through these facilities, and these we learned from CERN, from the particle physicists, and from astronomy, if you want to be uh, uh, heard by the governments, either you shout, but it does not help because there is a lot of noise, or you have a network of people, either in the country or in Europe, and if it is necessary, you trigger the network with an email saying you contact this politician that was pre-arranged pre uh, in your uh, region or in your country or your government and this is a uh, phase locked amplification and if you do this you are much more effective than trying to be visible and uh, jump around uh, when you have when you need to speak to the politicians with this i hope that i have given some good advice Thank you. Uh, many thanks for these useful tricks. I would now like to invite all the presenters to join me here because we are going to take uh, the questions from the audience. I would also like to thank everybody for keeping the time because we are well within the time. Uh, and uh, so this was really a very uh, amazing session. We started with big numbers, then two beautiful examples of the materials of tomorrow and in the following years. And at the end, we will even learn how to get uh, more money from the government. So now we are looking forward to your questions. Please. The microphone is, the microphone is over there. So who wants to start? Yes. So, I mean, I have a question for Professor Rizzuto about this, this uh, CERIC and ERIC project. Uh, I was wondering how difficult it is to harmonize the different work safety, uh, safety rules between the different countries that take part to one's ERIC project. I imagine that, uh, I mean, you put some equipment in common, but also you put some manpower. 
and the workers have the right to benefit from the same safety rules which may differ from one country to another one. How do you manage with that? Well, uh, each country has operating safety rules, so um, you don't have to impose extra safety rules. The only point is that you have to control whether these are applied, and uh, partly this was a problem with uh, the, uh, the plant in, uh, in Serbia, because uh, uh, being an ion facility, ion acceleration facility, we were not completely satisfied with the applied safety rules. So uh, we check whether they are applied, but uh, we leave to the country to be responsible for the application. Okay. Uh, while we wait for the next question, uh, I would like to ask Yuri on the Zoom, uh, what do you think are the most per uh, perspective uh, materials to replace uh, these current uh, lithium-ion batteries, which are probably not very good for the environment? Uh, well, um, I believe that iron-based cathodes, uh, conversion cathodes, in combination with, uh, say, uh, silicon carbon anodes, will probably provide for lithium-ion batteries the most viable alternative. However, we see a growth of metal sulfur batteries, uh, sodium sulfur batteries, including uh, or that uh, eliminate uh, lithium. Uh, there are sodium and zinc ion batteries, which again use abundant elements here. However, what is also important to keep in mind for the community, Introducing new materials into very established multi-multi-billion dollar markets is always a major challenge, even, even if they have uh, environmental or even cost advantages. So probably introduction will start from niche application. That's why uh, I talked about wearable, flexible, printable, where current materials simply cannot work. And eventually new materials new technologies will work their way into mainstream, which may take a couple of decades. Thank you. Uh, so we still wait for the, yes, yes, please. My question is for Laszlo. Uh, beautiful data on uh, aerosol deposition and obtaining nice data and nice uh, experiments. Can you say something about, you, you measure um, 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 you, you measure um, the rate, velocity of particles during deposition, or you calculate it, the, the particles deposition? Well, I mean, we just tried. <laughs> we just tried, and, and uh, it was a, a long procedure to learn because uh, such a material, such a viscous material, uh, has never been used. You know. And uh, the advantage of this, this perovskite that during the fly, during the flight, uh, then during the flight, uh, there is a, a precursor structure which is formed. You know? So it arrives to the, su the substrate already as a pre-crystallized something. And, uh, and that's why it doesn't spread out. You know? So it stays you know, at a, a dedicated place. And after the deposition uh, with time, uh, it, tam it transforms into the, the right structure. Um, uh, by the way, a colleague of, of ours, uh, Veiko, he was in my lab working on, on this project. Okay, uh, I have a question for Ivan. Uh, thank you first for a beautiful presentation of all these numbers in chemistry. Uh, what do you think is uh, like based on your analysis of different numbers of compounds, which compounds would be like the most useful in the next few years for the hum humanity? Which compounds? Which compounds should be developed? Yes, uh, that don't exist today, but we should have them. Question which I cannot answer. Okay. And I think nobody could answer this question. Yes, it's probably true. Uh, so th then I would like to ask Laszlo again about this new solar cells, the perovskites. Are there, uh, which, which types of perovskites would be like the, the best materials for the solar cells of tomorrow? How much better will they be from those that are today? Well, it seems that this, this uh, methyl ammonium lead iodide is very promising. Okay. You know, so there are okay. already plants in, in Oxford and uh, you know, in Belgium. They are producing it or at least 
they are trying to produce in large quantities. Mm -hmm. And in terms of, of efficiency, they are the best. So, so all the other versions with, with tin or replacing uh, other cations are not so efficient. So uh, the problem is this, this uh, toxicity and mm -hmm. also the stability. There are some stability mm -hmm. issues with it. I think that uh, our trick with the phosphate mm -hmm. uh, would, could be very promising because I haven't uh, emphasized, but in these uh, solar cells, one has to have a whole transporting layer and electron transporting layer between the, uh, the both sides of the perovskites. And uh, especially the whole transporting layer is very expensive. You know. So mm -hmm. this phosphate, if we can find the right doping, you know, mm -hmm. it could be both electron and whole uh, transporting layers. And uh, so we can replace the, the expensive uh, substructure and also mm -hmm. they can be they can serve as a protective layer. So I think mm -hmm. there is still, I mean, a lot to do, a mm -hmm. uh, lot to uh, investigate. I think mm -hmm. this is one of the future directions. Thank you. Next question. Uh, my question is to Professor Gagauci. Uh, thank you for your presentation, uh, as well as all the other speakers. Um, so the Maxine seems to be um, uh, has an enormous phenomenal number of applications and possibilities. Um, do you have any uh, uh, for this um, area's interactions with industry? So uh, you can in a sense expedite uh, the techno potential technology transfer? Uh, yes, of course, um, universities, uh, university labs can develop materials. Uh, universities don't produce anything. Uh, for, uh, one of the really uh, first uh, companies we started to work with was a large Japanese electronic company, Murata, Murata Manufacturing, which is a Fortune 1000 company, the largest uh, manufacturer of capacitors in the world and leading manufacturer of electronics for, first of all, uh, electric cars, but pretty much all devices here. They licensed a large number of patents uh, from uh, Drexel University. They explored the material applications. And of course, as a big company, they are looking for very, very large markets here. However, we work with a number of other companies in the US and abroad. Uh, for example, uh, technology for ad adsorption of urea to build uh, improved dialysis uh, for people who suffer from kidney disease and eventually develop artificial kidney was initially licensed by a Korean company. But then they created a US subsidiary, Nefria Bio, to specifically work on vaccines for dialysis applications. Uh, and of course, there are a number of companies in the world uh, producing uh, Maxines, um, Sigma Aldrich, uh, leading, the leading manufacturer of materials for research purposes, uh, also acquired the license. They started to sell max, max phases and we expect Maxines uh, to be in their catalog uh, any moment here. So yes, it's going, but it is a long process. And uh, of course, as probably all researchers feel, uh, takes longer than we would like. But that's reality of time. It takes time to transfer materials, even materials with unique properties, from the lab to real products. Hey, can I have a follow-up question? So do you have any um, programs or the industries that you collaborate have any projects that uh, they either send their scientists to, to work with you or you send your students in internships? Um, both ways, yes. Short answer is yes. For example, we have scientists from Murata working at Drexel University in my laboratory, doing research, we published joint paper, we filed patent jointly. Very similar way, for example, uh, right before pandemic, uh, the pandemic actually made student exchange challenging uh, the COVID uh, era last two years, but right before pandemic, one of my PhD students spent six months at HP, Hewlett Packard facility in San Diego, working on injured printing, Maxine inks, where she brought experience from our laboratory 
uh, on Maxins and Maxin Colloidal Solutions and HP as a leading manufacturer of printers uh, used their experience to design cartridges and processes for manufacturing printed electronics using Maxins. I think it's very useful, I think it's very helpful, and this is something that may help to accelerate uh, transfer of technology from research labs to industry. Can I ask a follow-up? Uh, so how about the national labs like Sandia Livermore that has a uh, significant program on materials and also the, the, in Colorado there is a center for energy, I forget mm -hmm. the initials at this point. Um, yes. do you have very similar way. So um, you could see from my very last slide, we have a very, very large number of collaborations. And I know it was difficult to uh, follow all the names and affiliations, but for uh, the past uh, 12 years, we were involved in a research center, Energy Frontier Research Center, with the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, which is uh, one of the leading Department of Energy National Labs in the US. And we had multiple students, postdocs, going there to perform experiments, staying there. Uh, one of them, actually, uh, this PhD student uh, who produced the first vaccine, the Drexel, Michael Nagib, he went there as a postdoctoral fellow prior to receiving a faculty position at Tulane University. Uh, so we collaborate closely. We collaborate with other laboratories uh, in the United States. Uh, because uh, national labs offer unique facilities, synchrotrons, neutron spallation source, uh, wonderful, uh, very expensive transmission electron microscope, high resolution microscopy and situ microscopy. So this is a great opportunity in addition, of course, to excellent intellectual resources, uh, top scientists here. So we work with Brookhaven National Laboratory, we work with the Argo National Laboratory, we work with Oak Ridge National Laboratory. As you see, most of those are Department of Energy National Lab, uh, naturally because uh, they are involved in research on energy, gen renewable energy generation and storage. Great, thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If I may continue, you, uh, we were talking earlier about supercapacitors. Uh, do you think that, uh, I know they have a different purpose than batteries, but they are more environmentally friendly. So is there at least part of applications of batteries where they could be replaced by supercapacitors in the near future? Yes, uh, and also not just replacing, complementing. Okay. For example, one of the success stories in Europe is a skeleton technology company. This company largely used technology that uh, we were working on for many years, carbide-derived carbons. This company started from Estonia. Uh, they built a facility in Germany, uh, attracted a very large amount of private capital, received numerous awards uh, in Europe for their performance. And there are numerous applications, ranging from starting uh, agents in cold weather to rotating blades of wind uh, uh, turbines, uh, uh, to uh, replacing batteries in, for example, industrial robots, uh, cars that can be charged quickly. The main advantage is very fast charging. And second, as you mentioned correctly, there is less energy losses because when you convert energy from basically power line or solar cell to a uh, battery, you lose significant amount. You convert it, basically recover energy from battery again. Supercapacitors, much more energy efficient and charge quickly. So for example, when you have industrial robots running 24 hours a day in a, a large warehouse, if you use batteries, you need to have at least two, if not three times larger numbers because say running after eight hours, imagine they run here, you need to put them recharge. So you need to have an extra complete set, which may be for large warehouses, huge number of robots uh, to do uh, the work. Supercapacitor just charge momentarily and then continue working, even the charge more frequently here. So there are an emerging number of applications and clearly Maxins add something more because they store more energy compared to carbon and charge even faster because titanium 32 Maxine, just to give you an idea, 
has a conductivity about two orders of magnitude higher compared to activated carbons, materials traditionally used in supercapacitor, or an order of magnitude higher to carbide uh, carbons here. So I think that's definitely an area where uh, one can anticipate further growth. So my suggestion, check skeleton technology site. They provide information about a variety of uh, uh, applications for electrochemical capacitors, supercapacitor, ultra capacitors, whichever way uh, you call them. Thank you. Uh, we'll take uh, one more question. Uh, we actually continue until the organizers say we have to stop. So I think this is the last question. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I want to thank all the speakers and I have a question for Professor Rizzuto. You mentioned large facilities. Uh, I guess uh, that huge problem is maintenance and the question is how do you stay on the front of state of the art? Well, in two ways. Uh, one is uh, pestering the governments and uh, uh, pushing them to keep on investing with the black mail that otherwise we go away. And this is uh, very efficient because if you have an international organization telling you that otherwise it goes away, most governments react to this. Or uh, putting together uh, European projects or funding that the ERIC is collecting from various sources and then investing in that facility to upkeep it. What uh, the approach that we have been uh, now doing mostly is that we go to the government and we say, if you spend, uh, let's say so, we will put more, we will co-fund. So this becomes attractive on two ways. One is the political way and the second on the financial way. So at this point, uh, we can, by co-funding, we make sure that uh, the local authorities and governments in particular upkeep the facilities and eventually renovate them completely. Uh, this is really the last question. Again for, again for, for you, for Carlo Risotto. Uh, yes, the ERIC is a certain uh, big advance in Europe, but I remember that uh, we were fearing that uh, by having this uh, Eric umbrella, uh, we will be submitted to the uh, European bureaucracy, uh, which, uh, uh, is, uh, which, which, which is not adapted at all with, uh, with the research uh, work. So did it improve now? Is it okay now? Or, or do, do researchers complain of the bureaucracy imposed on them? I remember the counting the time spent on the university. No, because uh, uh, there is another part of the trick that uh, the European Union does not fund the ERICs because uh, the funding comes from the countries that are members of the ERIC. It's the same trick of CERN. So uh, the European Commission may fund some specific project, additional project. Uh, uh, speaking of the European bureaucracy, actually one thing that we have been uh, fighting is that they tend to be like the midwife. They give birth to an Eric and they forget about it. So we are trying now to needle them into remembering that these are institutions that they have been setting up and therefore they should feed them if needed at the right moment. So, but the bureaucracy of, actually we decrease the bureaucracy of the European Commission because the ERIC is independent from the procurement rules of the European Commission because it's an international organization. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Uh, I know there are still many questions. We could continue this discussion until the late evening because we have such interesting guests. Uh, nevertheless, the organizers asked me that we thank the organizers, uh, that we thank the presenters for really beautiful speeches. I, I, I believe they have brought us hope that there is a better future with the science that is being developed so that in spite of these difficult days that we live today, we can expect a better future in the next decades. And thank you, everybody. And now we have a break. Thank you. <laughs>